to, to, dzięki, to dzięki pani profesor Heidel ukazała się w ubiegłym roku, um, ukazał się przekład książki pana profesora pod tytułem Przekład w epoce cyfrowej. Dziękuję bardzo. As this lecture is in English, I'm going to switch into English now. Thank you for this uh, introduction, very generous one. And I must say it's my great pleasure and privilege to welcome Michael Cronin uh, to our conference in Krakow. Um, it, yes, we have spent quite a lot of time together last year, or two years ago really, translating, uh, without being in the same place, translating, uh, working on the translation of um, translation in the digital age. Uh, there are some translators, the true heroes of this book, uh, here with us, Elżbieta Koziołkiewicz and Zosia Ziman. Uh, myself, I was just um, uh, supervising their work and there was not much to supervise, although there were, <laughs> there were um, uh, very interesting and difficult discussions as the language and the, the issues discussed in this um, book are not only on the forefront of the discipline, so uh, they are sometimes very difficult conceptually, but also they are on the forefront of language. And it turned out that there are whole areas of reality that have no linguistic apparatus, if I might say so, um, in Polish. Uh, that there is a lot of um, things that are discussed in English only, or that the uh, lexical items are not stable in Polish. Uh, or that there are many uh, possible solutions to choose from, etc., etc. Well, um, I must say that this was a challenge, but this was also a great pleasure. And I think that translating any of Michael Cronin's book would be uh, an experience like that, uh, because his w research, his enormous research, and his uh, uh, stunningly um, uh, um, systematic research is always with the things and the, the phenomenon that, phenomena that, that happen at the borderline between the known and the unknown. So it's, uh, uh, it, it concerned uh, translation globalization, a book in 2003. I'm just enumerating a, a couple of his books. Um, translation and identity, 2006. Uh, translation goes to the movies, 2009. Uh, translation in the digital age. Uh, which was published in Poland uh, last year, and by the way, uh, at the table back in the back on the back of the room, you can you can actually buy this book and perhaps ask for the author for for the signature uh, for the dedication. <laughs> and then the new book uh, that I have just received as a present, Echo Translation, um, Translation and Ecology in the Age of the Anthropocene. Um, and this is the topic of today's lecture. And uh, we are going to learn more about uh, this fascinating um, borderline, or border space between human language and the language of the non-human, and the language of uh, what we have to communicate with, but sometimes have no tools for. Um, thank you very much for accepting the invitation, and the floor is yours. Uh, would you be able to hear me without the microphone? Uh, no, no, okay. Uh, that's, uh, okay, right, that's no problem. Um, okay, well, the first thing I would like to do is to thank Professor Hedl for the extremely uh, generous uh, introduction. Uh, I would uh, most particularly uh, like to thank uh, all of the students uh, here for in inviting me. Um, I'm often much more touched by student invitations than I'm by uh, invitations from uh, my academic colleagues, because um, partly because students have no money, uh, so I know what a big thing it is to try and get somebody uh, from elsewhere to come uh, and speak. Uh, but also, of course, because uh, you are the translators and the translation scholars of the future. Um, so it's particularly, I, I suppose, uh, for me, it's important that, you know, at some time in the distant future, uh, when you're towards the end of your career, uh, you'll remember this <clears throat> odd creature that turned up from Dublin at some stage and said something uh, that might have made uh, some uh, sense. Um, I'm, as I say, I'm going to be speaking uh, in, in, in English. Um, do, if I'm speaking too fast or, you know, do you put up your, your, your hand, you, you will notice that I'm not quite speaking with the accent that you'll be used to from your, your language tapes over the years. So that too can be a, a, a problem at, at, at times. So we, we'll see how, how, how we get on. Um, basically, what I'm going to try and do um, today 
is to um, speak briefly to this notion of uh, eco-translation uh, and why I, I think it's important. Um, and then I'm going to look uh, specifically um, at the area of food, um, as food as a way of thinking about uh, ecology, of thinking about uh, translation, uh, and thinking about culture in, in particular uh, ways. So I wanted to begin with um, the, this particular um, magazine here, uh, well known uh, in the Anglophone world, New York Review of Books. And in 2013, it was celebrating its 50th uh, anniversary. Um, the uh, person who was invited to, uh, to write uh, the key article uh, for the um, issue was Timothy Garton uh, Ash, who's you know, uh, written about uh, Poland amongst uh, other uh, countries. Um, so what he was asked to do was, would he describe the major things that had happened in the world between 1963 and 2013? Um, so he talked uh, about um, the end of uh, the Cold War. Uh, he talked about the rise of China as a superpower. He talked about the rise and gradual fall of America as a hyper uh, power. He talked about the increasing importance of the uh, Arab world. He talked about the digital uh, revolution. But there was not one single word in the 6,200 words about the fact that sea levels are rising, um, that the oceans are becoming acidified, uh, that we're destroying species on the planet at an unprecedented uh, rate, um, that we have 60% more carbon dioxide emissions now than in uh, 1990. In other words, there was not a single word, not a single line, about the single greatest challenge facing humanity, not just in this century, but in centuries uh, to, uh, to come. Um, so I began to um, think about this uh, in terms of uh, uh, translation, because one of the things that we are now entering into is what is called the age of the Anthropocene. Um, basically, after the end of the Ice Age, for 12,000 years, we had what was called the Holocene. Um, so the, the gradual uh, warming of the planet, the emergence of agriculture, the emergence uh, of uh, big cities, um, of settled uh, communities, uh, and the emergence of civilizations as, as we know them. Um, what happened um, beginning around about uh, 200 years ago is that we began to move into a different geological period. That with the increasing uh, emissions of carbon dioxide, that human activities now are on the same scale as other geological forces, like the movement of tectonic plates, like the eruption of volcanoes. So humans are no longer just biological agents, we kind of work with the environment, uh, but we are now geological agents. We, we have the, the power to shape, uh, if you like, the, the, the destiny of pretty much everything else on the, uh, the planet. But at the same time as we have this, we now realize that if we continue on the way we are continuing, uh, we will destroy the very planet um, that we inhabit, um, that we will uh, no longer be able to survive as, as a species. So we have to think about how we relate to other species on the planet and how we relate to the non-human world. But how can you do that if you don't think about translation? In other words, how can you think about uh, these forms of relationships uh, unless you think uh, about uh, how this is to happen? How is this communication space going to be created? How are we going to get a sense of the, uh, the non-human, uh, uh, the sense of other species, if we have no intelligible way of relating uh, to these uh, parts of the, the non-human uh, world. So what I'm going to um, focus on um, uh, this morning is um, an aspect of this eco, what I'm calling eco-translation, uh, uh, which is to do with, uh, with food, because food is one of those things uh, that links us to other species, uh, links us uh, to the, uh, the non-human uh, uh, world. And what I'm going to basically argue is that when we think about food in a modern uh, age, uh, 
it forces us to think about translation issues, and it forces us to think about translation issues which show how central a translation is to thinking about the kind of future we're likely to have as speakers of languages, as people who live in cultures, and as people who share uh, one uh, planet, uh, planet uh, Earth uh, to, to, together. Now, one of the, um, if you like, factors that affects um, food or the production of food is, uh, is technology. And I want to begin by saying a word or two about uh, technology. And of course, this will be kind of following on from the, uh, the book that was uh, translated uh, here in Poland, Translation in the Digital uh, Age. And I have to say, uh, my heart went out to the translators because sometimes when I read my own work, my heart sinks. I think, how on earth uh, could somebody translate that into uh, another uh, language? So um, I really, uh, I have nothing but admiration uh, for the, uh, the group of translators who, uh, who did this translation. Um, but I want to um, begin with, uh, so this is the, uh, just the, the, the book that has just come out, which um, deals with uh, a number of these topics. This is what they call, uh, in American uh, films, product placement. You know, it's when you, you get the close-up of the Chevrolet car or the Ford, so this is a bit of product placement on my part. Um, but I just want to begin with uh, two uh, quotes, one from Inglis and, and Gimlin. Uh, Food lies at the very heart of human existence, just as the individual person must eat. So too does any form of social order have to organize the production, distribution, and consumption of uh, foodstuffs. So food is both an extremely individual and personal thing, but it's also a social thing, because this is how uh, we have to think about how we uh, distribute, or organize, and produce food on a mass uh, scale. Um, Proven says, we grapple with concerns about the animate and the inanimate, the human and non-human, about authenticity and sincerity, about changing familial patterns, about the local and the global, about whether sexual and elementary uh, predilections tell us anything about ourselves, about colonial legacies of the past for those of us who live in stolen lands, about whether we are eaten, eating uh, or being eaten. So food, if you like, touches on uh, all of these. But as I said, one of the things that it touches on is uh, technology. Um, and I wanted to begin with um, this um, book by uh, Eric Brynjolfsson and Andrew McAfee, The Second Machine Age, Work, Progress and Prosperity in Time of Brilliant Technologies. Uh, and they point to, if you like, the increasing gap between uh, what they call economic uh, growth and job creation uh, in many contemporary economies. Um, even when you have economies, for example, such as the US economy, which began to recover after the Great Recession of 2008, although the growth figures were up, unemployment statistics remained consistently uh, depressed. Uh, the revenue worth of firms and economies were growing, but the workforce was not. Increasingly, the problem is, it is the failure to hire rather than the tendency to fire um, that is generating joblessness where the populations uh, are growing. Between 2000 and 2010, for example, uh, the population of the United States grew by 30 million. Um, it would be necessary to create 18 million uh, jobs uh, to create the same uh, number of the population working in the year 2000. However, in that period, uh, overall growth in employment was close to zero. Um, for Brynjolfsson and McAfee, uh, the answer, uh, or the explanation for this, lies in what they call the Great uh, Restructuring, which marks the shift towards digitalized and automated forms of production in areas which previously would have been seen as the province of the human. So these areas involved advanced uh, mental abilities, such as pattern recognition and capabilities, and high-level communication skills. These were things we thought were before the things that humans could do, but uh, machines uh, couldn't. Uh, they give two examples of this. One is uh, driverless cars, the kind of Google uh, driverless uh, car. Uh, I sometimes think that in Dublin we've already anticipated this because a lot of the driving in Dublin, you really do think there is nobody driving the cars because they just drive around uh, anyway. But the thing is, this will be uh, autumn. But the other example they give is machine uh, translation. Um, and they offer as an example of this um, the GeoFluent uh, translation uh, tool. Um, uh, 
I can just, um, which is produced by Lionbridge uh, Technologies. Um, basically, what this does is it allows for the automatic translation of messages to call centers, um, to, to staff. Uh, they generate uh, responses, which are then automatically uh, translated into different languages. So the languages are English, French, uh, Spanish, uh, German, Italian, Portuguese, uh, Russian, uh, Arabic, uh, traditional simplifies Chinese and uh, Japanese. Um, so uh, as you can see, uh, what the chat tool promises is translation uh, without tears, uh, the ability to quickly and cost-effectively engage and support customers in global markets through an online chat session, uh, regardless of the languages uh, spoken. Now, Brynjolfsson and McAfee uh, claim that there are very high levels of user satisfaction of uh, the service, but they don't actually go into much details uh, on what they mean by this, uh, other than people feel that these, uh, this chat tool can carry out uh, meaningful uh, action. Um, but the, the problem is not so much what, you know, the kind of the inadequate evaluation of, of the tool as the larger picture that they're describing, which is the shift to the automation uh, of higher level cognitive uh, activities, um, which is borne out, if you like, um, by developments in a number of uh, different uh, areas. Um, we can see this, for example, uh, in the fact that increasingly um, the revenue that is generated in economies is going to people uh, who uh, own uh, machines uh, and technologies rather than uh, people who are engaged in salaried uh, employment. And this is why we're getting this kind of global divergence uh, in inc income distribution across uh, societies. But there's also the fact um, that the technologies uh, themselves uh, are changing in a ways that are sometimes misunderstood. Uh, we tend to say, when we talk about changing technologies, to talk about Moore's Law. Uh, which was first formulated in 1965 in Electronics Magazine that the processing power of uh, computers uh, doubles uh, every uh, two uh, years. But what we tend to forget is that more importantly, it's not so much processing power as software capabilities. Uh, one study, for example, that was carried out by uh, a man called uh, Martin Grütschel, um, he looked at the ability of computers to handle a number of kind of standard computational uh, problems uh, between 1988 and 2003. Um, and he found that their effectiveness had improved 43 million uh, fold. Um, so in other words, um, the uh, effectiveness at a software level is uh, increasing at an unprecedented rate. And sometimes, because we're fixated on processing capacity, uh, we tend to forget or neglect uh, this uh, factor. Um, one of the um, examples um, that they use to, um, to describe this is um, the invention of chess. Um, that um, the person who uh, invented uh, chess, um, it's described um, in the, the Book of Kings, the, the Shanama, uh, where the Persian poet Ferdowsi talks about how the, uh, the person who invented chess was presented uh, to the, uh, the king. Uh, the king thought it was such a wonderful game. He says, you know, what would you uh, like as a, um, a prize? And he said, well, simple. I just like uh, one grain of wheat on the first square of the chessboard. Then I'd like two grains on the second square of the chessboard. I'd like four grains on the and the mathematically smart people in you in the audience now realize that he was asking for an awful lot of grains of wheat. In fact, he was looking for uh, two to the power of 64 minus one grains of wheat, which is about as high as Mount Everest. Hmm? Um, so, uh, so basically, the metaphor that they use is that with technological development, um, that we're moving towards what they call uh, what they call the second half of the chessboard, where, if you like, the, 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 the number of grains of wheat are beginning, they were very small in the beginning, but now they're beginning to increase uh, exponentially. Mm -hmm. um, that the development, particularly a software-driven development, is increasing exponentially. Now, what I want you to do is hold that image for uh, a moment, <clears throat> and I want to relate this notion of the grains of wheat uh, 
to a similar kind of, of question, which directly relates to wheat and to food. Uh, and this is the question uh, of uh, food uh, itself. Um, the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization estimates um, that given predictions for population growth, um, that we will, uh, by the year 2050, we will have to increase food production by 70% uh, just to uh, keep up uh, with uh, the amount of food that needs to be uh, produced. So this is one factor, we an exponential growth in, in food production. The second is um, that because of changing diets and food consumption patterns, uh, food production and distribution has uh, become uh, globalized. Um, if you take, for example, um, avocados. Uh, in 1998, uh, 193,700 tons of avocados uh, were shipped to US distribution centers. 75% of these uh, were grown domestically and 25% were grown uh, elsewhere. Uh, by 2012, um, 713,900 uh, metric tons of avocados were shipped to U.S. distribution centers. Um, only 32% were grown uh, domestically, so less than a third, while 68% were imported uh, mainly from Mexico and uh, South uh, America. Um, so in other words, uh, the demand for food is uh, increasing exponentially. So technological capacity is increasing exponentially, the demand for food is increasing exponentially, and the demand for something else is increasing exponentially, uh, which is translation. Um, Common Sense Advisory uh, estimates the size of the translation service uh, in 2012 was around $33.5 billion uh, globally. Uh, Ibis World says this will increase to $37 uh, billion by 2018. The Euro Bureau, US Bureau of Statistics, the translation industry is likely to grow by 42% between 2010 and 2020, which is the fastest growing industrial sector of any sector uh, in the US. And the translation, uh, Panjanic, who's the globalization increase in immigration will keep the industry in demand for the coming years despite downwards costs uh, and cost pressures on the, uh, the services. One of the ways in which um, the demand or the increasing demand for food uh, was met uh, was through what was called the Green Revolution. Um, so the Green Revolution was basically something that began in the 1940s uh, with a man called uh, Norman Borlaug. And what Norman Borlaug uh, basically did was he developed uh, disease-resistant varieties of, of wheat. Right? Um, uh, these had two advantages. One was they were resistant to uh, a lot uh, of um, well-known uh, diseases that affected crops. Uh, the second thing is that they had a much higher yield than conventional varieties uh, of, of wheat. The way in which these wheat varieties would work is you had to use um, extensive, uh, you had to use pesticides extensively. You had to use fertilizers uh, extensively, and they worked best uh, with large uh, mechanized uh, agricultural uh, farms. So pesticides, uh, fertilizers, uh, mechanization, uh, this increased uh, the yield uh, of these uh, crops. Um, the, what was known as the Green Revolution had a, a, a particularly spectacular success in India in the 1960s when it was threatened uh, by uh, famine uh, and there was, if you like, the use uh, of these different uh, varieties with fertilizers, pesticides and mechanization to uh, increase uh, the, uh, the yields. Um, so if you like, the response uh, of the kind of the food sector um, to this kind of food crisis uh, was um, to, if you like, the, the scientificization of food production, um, and secondly, the technologization uh, of uh, food cultivation and food uh, production. Um, in order to assuage uh, or to deal with the question of uh, food uh, hunger. Uh, 
Um, if we think of what's happening in the localization industry at present, if we think what's happening in the translation industry, um, with the whole movement towards uh, automation uh, uh, of uh, translation services, we can see that there's the exact uh, same thing happening. So it's the same kind of techno-scientific response to the kind of growing translation hunger uh, that I've described uh, there in some of the statistics in one of the uh, earlier uh, slides. Um, and indeed, in 2006, um, Alan Melby, who's a machine translation uh, scholar, he made a prediction which he said himself was a bit scary. Um, he said that in the future, the only kind of non-literary translator who will be in demand is uh, one who can craft coherent texts that when appropriate, uh, override the blind suggestions of the computer. In other words, uh, his argument is that the computer is firmly in the second half of the chessboard, translation is also in the second half of the chessboard, so the ideal marriage or alliance uh, is to team up both uh, parties in order to produce uh, a happy marriage uh, for the, uh, the coming uh, century. But here is where I'm going to uh, enter uh, a caveat. Here is where I'm going to suggest that the future might not quite be the one uh, that I've just uh, sketched. Um, because what has been um, the uh, reaction of um, people in various parts of the world uh, to the increased industrialization uh, of the production of food? And when we look at that reaction, can we think about what may be potential reactions to the industrialization of, of language? And then might we look to food translation to see that uh, the, the sketching out or the suggestion of other or different kinds of futures for uh, translation. Um, one of the um, responses um, to the industrialization of uh, Food uh, was uh, the emergence of the slow food movement. Um, this began in Rome um, in 1986. Uh, McDonald's uh, wanted to build, uh, open a branch near the Spanish steppes in, in Rome. Um, a group of activists led by Carlo Petrinelli um, organized uh, a, a protest uh, against this. Uh, and this started, if you like, the beginning of the uh, slow uh, food movement, uh, which is now present in over 160 uh, countries uh, worldwide. Uh, um, the kind of basic philosophy of the slow food movement uh, was um, outlined in a document called The Central Role of uh, Food. Um, and the main target, if you like, of the slow food movement has been what they call the massification uh, an industrialization of food uh, production. Um, and in a you know, particularly important sort of paragraph or two paragraphs in the manifesto, they say, paradoxical but true today, we're living through a moment in history in which the main threat to the life of so many species is precisely the production of food, the element indispensable for life. The very thing that is supposed to sustain us may, in fact, be killing us. Uh, Large-scale food production, agro-industry, Monoculture, chemical agriculture, these are the main culprits of the disaster. Sustainable local agriculture based on native techniques and species, which does not make indiscriminate use of chemicals, which does not waste water resources and which is concerned about more than just quantity, this is an effective tool to correct the current uh, situation. So the notion of food security, um, access to a variety of quality foods is threatened uh, by this kind of large-scale uh, farming uh, system, and that food has increasingly become a kind of a commodity uh, which is uh, used for speculative uh, purposes. Um, so if we think of um, <clears throat> the, uh, what I said about translation, the translation hunger, um, and one of the things that the industrialized production uh, of translated language is doing. It's a kind of response to that translation hunger, to the kind of growing uh, need for uh, translation. We might ask ourselves, is there an equivalent of the slow food movement in the area of translation? Um, should there be an equivalent of the slow food uh, movement uh, area in, in translation? Um, has there been a movement, for example, um, that has called into question the potential consequences 
for language ecology uh, of the mass production uh, of uh, translated uh, language. Um, is there a perceived need for a kind of a slow uh, translation uh, movement, which will be uh, similar to or comparable to the slow food movement in the area of uh, food production? Um, a woman called uh, an American cultural uh, writer and um, a poet, uh, Marilyn Chandler McIntyre, in a book called Caring for Words in a Culture of uh, Lies, um, argues that like water uh, or soil um, or air or plant species or food systems, um, that words are another precious shared resource that we have in common. And precisely because we have these in common, we tend not to value them, right? Like the, the air that's out there, water, soil, all of these things, because they were, they were, they were often shared, um, nobody valued them. Uh, or they only became valuable if they became private property. Um, so because nobody uh, has yet turned language into private property, uh, they would if they could, and of course they try to, with all these little or symbols beside words, um, but it is a part of the commons, but what is held in common you know, is it uh, genuinely uh, valued? Uh, and she argues that like food, language has been industrialized. Words come to us processed like cheese, depleted of nutrients, flattened and packaged, artificially colored and mass marketed. And just as it takes little extra effort to an intention to find, buy, eat, and support the production of organic foods, it is a strenuous business to insist, insist on usable, flexible, precise, uh, enlivening uh, language. Um, so for McIntyre, the fact that language is omnipresent in our aural uh, environment, uh, television, uh, radio, uh, piped music, the intense investment that we have in text-based uh, technologies, surfing the internet, uh, sending uh, emails, uh, texting uh, on our smartphones, means, as she says, that our environment is glutted with words, sung, spoken, written, to be consumed thoughtlessly like disposable uh, products. Um, so the all-pervasiveness of the language of advertising, the kind of spin or rhetoric that you get in political discourse, uh, and the damaging uses of unexamined metaphors, she says, um, all point to the uncontrolled inflation uh, of uh, language. Uh, in the private and public lives of, of people, and the toxic effects of this productivism. For example, she says, if everything your child does is awesome, well, nothing your child does is awesome. In other words, you, know, you, you kind of, you, you void uh, the, the, the word of any meaning. Um, when you work for Microsoft um, or Hewlett Packard, uh, and it's described in the literature as you're part of the family, really? Your family tends not to change the locks on your door and ask the security personnel to escort you to the front door uh, when uh, your job has been removed uh, or you've been fired. Um, so is it really the same as uh, a family? Uh, and when war is described, it was described by a recent Secretary of State in the US, as a job we have to finish, uh, are we really uh, using language in a way that is uh, productive rather than uh, deeply uh, harmful. Um, so she advocates then as, as, uh, the need for what she calls a kind of stewardship of, of language. And what she means by this, and I want to quote her, to savor and linger over words that we taste with delight and take in uh, slowly. And she goes further and she says, maybe we need a slow language movement like the slow food movement that would encourage us to cook and eat and digest the sentences we share with uh, one uh, another. Um, what I want to suggest is that if we want to look at what this might, what this might appear uh, for us as translators, as people who study translation, um, one area that we could look at, because I want to kind of connect our kind of food and, and, and trans translation and, and technology, is the area of food translation uh, itself. And I want to begin with, um, and this is my, my first point in this, uh, what I'm going to call the translational productivity of food uh, items. Um, and where this becomes most apparent is in online translation forums, like the ones that all of you 
here, I'm sure, uh, have used at various points, uh, where people are discussing how to translate uh, particular uh, food uh, items. Um, and one of these is, uh, on the Lonely Planet site, you have a kind of a forum which is, is basically to do with food, people kind of discussing food in, in different uh, countries. Um, and one of the, um, uh, the posts from, to the forum from BG, BJD wanted to know whether creme fraiche uh, was the same thing as uh, sour uh, cream. Yeah, so was this kind of creme fraiche here the same thing as uh, sour uh, cream? And of course, some of you will recognize uh, some familiar product uh, uh, to at the bottom of your screen there uh, on the, uh, the right-hand side. Um, um, so <clears throat> one of the, um, the uh, so, the, so BJD says, what's the difference? Here in France, nothing is called sour cream. So it's the Americans living in France. So I've been using creme fraiche as a substitute for years. In Quebec, I, I guess they call it creme aigre or creme sur. She's got a little hat. Uh, but I've noticed lately, including in a very recent post by Fieldgate, that in English, people are saying uh, creme fraiche. So is it very different from sour uh, cream? Um, this prompted a response from Textibule, and Textibule uh, was uh, very emphatic uh, and also referred to the Bible, uh, Wikipedia. Uh, very different, I'd say. Uh, I've met expats here in France over the years who've tried to make their own sour cream by adding lemon juice or vinegar or whatever to creme fraiche. But getting the sour cream thing right seems difficult. And then, but uh, from Wikipedia, uh, creme fraiche is a sour cream containing 34 pounds of butter fat and having pH of around 4.5. It's sour to bacterial culture, but it's less sour than US style sour cream. A lower viscosity and a higher fat content European label. And it's allows the other than cream and bacterial culture. The name creme fraiche is French, but similar uh, sour creams are found in much of uh, northern uh, Europe. Um, and then uh, the Polish jury comes in, uh, and the form of uh, bitchka, uh, so uh, piaczka, piaczka, uh, says, uh, sure can, brought uh, some śmietana, 12% uh, today to add to the cheesecake I'll be making, making later this evening. Greetings from Poland. It's, kind of, it's like Eurovision, sort of, you know. This is the vote of the Polish jury. Um, so the Swedish post from Fieldgate, uh, so then there's a Swedish post uh, from Fieldgate uh, on the Swedish variety of sour cream. As Textibul said, they're very different. Here in Sweden, we have both. Crème fraîche goes under the French name, while sour cream is called Gretro, in free translation, cream sour. Uh, uh, crème fraîche is much thicker with fat contents 30 to 34 percent. That makes it good for cooking like full cream, although there is a difference in density and the taste. Regular cream is sweeter. Sour cream, or uh, Swedish kratfil, are like Polish śmietana. Uh, the the uh, fat content is 12 percent and the taste is mildly sour. It's mostly used in dishes that are not cooked. It can't be used in cooking as it would curdle unless you mix it before cooking with other ingredients and in certain uh, proportions. Um, so what we find uh, here in these uh, different uh, examples is that the attempt to find an equivalent to try and negotiate this kind of tra translation relationship between sour cream and crème fraîche, what's happening is you're getting a kind of slowing down of the translational process because what you're trying to do is find what might be uh, the particular kinds of equivalents that are there. The second thing that you're doing is that once in translation you're setting up that kind of relational uh, that, that sort of comparison which, in which you're trying to arrive at some kind of definition of what are the similarities and the differences uh, between uh, creme fraiche and sour cream, you're then opening up uh, the different kind of uh, contextual, cultural or food histories of the different countries in which these uh, terms are to be uh, found. Um, so what if you like um, all of these different posts, and you can find thousands of them on the internet, is that these posts around uh, the translation of food uh, items, um, which generate uh, all these kinds of translational uh, equivalents, um, that one of the things that they're doing is that they're doing precisely what McIntyre is saying we should be doing, which is encouraging us um, to kind of cook, eat, and digest the words or sentences of, of language. You're actually having to kind of savor and think and digest them slowly in order to think about how you might uh, translate them. Um, the second uh, level 
um, in which I think this notion of food translation um, plays out um, in terms of a different approach to uh, translation um, is uh, the importance of place or context. Remember, one of the, the key or core arguments of the slow food movement is that food production, where possible, should be uh, localized. That one of the, 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 the viable or the viability or sustainability of agroecology depends on being able to, uh, if you like, relate to the particular uh, circumstances or areas in which uh, food can potentially be uh, produced. Um, in the manifesto, the central role of food, they say the local dimension respects the needs of the land, and we can actively support this dimension through the act of producing or choosing the food we eat. So producing food locally and consuming food that is uh, produced uh, locally. Um, I would argue that one of the areas in which this kind of the local context uh, or the notion of placidness is uh, particularly uh, important uh, is uh, in the area of um, the representation uh, and expression of food and food rituals in uh, literature. Um, if you like, understanding the culinary codes in literary uh, texts um, shows both how they kind of signify within the literary texts and how they re refer to aspects of social practice uh, in the extra-textual uh, world. Um, in the first novel of uh, Naguib Mahfouz, the Egyptian novelist, his Cairo trilogy, uh, Palace Walk, um, he describes a particular scene where this father uh, and his two sons are kind of sitting down to, uh, to breakfast. Um, and there is a kind of description of the, the, the morning meal um, that they're uh, have, having. And um, a man called uh, Sabri Hafez, who um, wrote on, on this particular novel, he says, the dishes eaten at breakfast reveal the social background of the family and even its national identity. Eggs, a full madamas, brown beans, cheese, pickled limes and peppers and hot loaves of flat round bread for breakfast put the family into the upper stratum of the middle class. While the presence of full madamas, fried and ghee and loaves of flat round bread make it unmistakably Egyptian, for Marimas is as Egyptian as bacon and eggs are British, right? And all of you sitting here, I'm sure, can think of transposing this to here in Krakow or Warsaw, any other part of Poland, that you could look at what, what is on a breakfast table and it would give you a clue to uh, the social class, uh, possibly the regional background, uh, the existence of perhaps uh, other uh, influences uh, or, or culinary traditions uh, through family alliances or, or whatever. In other words, um, that in trying to um, understand the full significance of what is on that table, you have to understand the placidness, the contextualization of food in that particular culture, which also means, of course, in terms of how one might uh, think um, uh, about translating it, um, in order to be able to understand the cultural cues, uh, you would have to uh, immerse yourself uh, in the, the, the background cultural detail. And this is, again, where I would argue slow translation comes into play. Uh, I've made a distinction um, in some of my other works between what I call the instantaneous time of automatic translation delivery, so the notion that you kind of press Google Translate uh, and out comes the, uh, the translation, and what I call the durational time of translator education. The, the way in which, uh, in order to acquire uh, a language uh, uh, and with it the, the culture, uh, you have to spend years and years and years and years. I spend uh, over uh, 30 years now uh, working with the, uh, the French uh, language. And the only thing I can, I can think are three words from Montaigne, que sais-je? You know, what, what, do I, what do I still know? The more I, I get to know that language or culture, the more I, I, I feel that uh, I need to know about it. And that applies not just to the language that I'm acquiring, but also to, the, to the two, the, my, two, uh, my two mother tongues. I have only one mother, but two mother tongues, uh, Irish Gaelic and, uh, and English. Uh, but in both those, those, those languages, uh, you know, I'm still, the more I 
learning, the more I, I, I need to, to know. Uh, and particularly when I'm translating, I'm working into this language, I realize more and more uh, that I don't know about my, my language as, 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 as I tr translate. Um, so, in other words, um, it, it seems to me that one of the things that that kind of the, the trying to read the contextual cues of culinary cultures, what that points to is that in order to function effectively as a translator to pick up those cues, uh, it points to the, the necessary kind of durational time of cultural and linguistic acquisition in translation uh, that points to, if you like, uh, a dimension to uh, uh, the practice of slow uh, translation, uh, which is highlighted, if you like, by this particular uh, aspect of uh, food uh, translation. The um, third uh, element that um, I want to uh, mention, and then I'm just going to uh, conclude by looking at um, uh, very briefly at intersemiotic translation, um, is the implications for um, food translation uh, in terms of how we think of translation uh, it's itself. Um, one of the um, arguments that's been made by uh, this man here, Timothy Ingold, uh, a British uh, soci uh, social anthropologist, um, is um, what he calls um, the logic of inversion. Um, basically, what he means by that is that I can draw uh, a circle. Hmm? Um, and there's two ways of looking at that circle. You can look at it as a circle, as a finished product, it's that thing that's, that's there. Um, or you can think about the process of the creation of the circle. You can consider the movement of your hand as it goes in a circular uh, way to create uh, that circle. What he would argue is that very often um, we neglect or ignore our bodily experiences of the, the world um, and are too preoccupied with products rather than processes. In other words, uh, you, you could say, I came to the university today, you know, I'm, I'm here in the university. Um, so that's the end point. Um, but how often are you going to talk about the actual process of how you got to the university, all the experiences that, that you had um, that, um, uh, on the, the, the way, which then get completely obscured by the fact that you said, I'm in the university, I've come to the, uh, the university. And he would say this uh, about you know, a lot of human activities, there's what he calls the logic of inversion, where we cancel out the process uh, by the, uh, the, the creation of, uh, or focus on the uh, end product. Now one could argue, this is precisely what happens with translation. Why are translators invisible? Why does the process of translation, is it so uh, often sort of ignored? Um, it's because we, we are subject to this logic of inversion, um, where what should be primary, the, the process of production, uh, is in fact becomes secondary or completely ignored uh, with the end focus uh, on product. And I want to take an example um, of this um, from the uh, translation of uh, food recipes. Um, a woman called uh, Brett uh, Jocelyn, who is, uh, works uh, as a translator in, in Sweden, and she's written a lot on the translation of uh, food uh, recipes. Um, and she talked about the difficulties that she encountered uh, while translating, uh, she was a project manager for the translation of two Australian cookbooks uh, into uh, Swedish. Um, the big problem was that a number of the ingredients uh, were specific to Australia or to Asian countries near Australia and were difficult to find uh, in Sweden. So the publisher's suggestion was, well, why don't you just put in substitutes? Things are easy to find uh, in Swedish uh, shops. Uh, but Epstein argued that by introducing uh, substitutes uh, without uh, alerting the readers, um, the recipes were being changed in a very uh, profound way. Um, so the solution that was found in the end uh, was to uh, include the original ingredients and a list of possible uh, substitutes. Um, however, Epstein goes a bit further and she says that the, this substitute of practice itself must be embedded in a wider uh, practice. Um, no. Uh, she says, for recipes, uh, translators ought to stick as closely as possible to the original, and if ideas for substitutes are being offered, the translator must explain why. 
Also, the translator or another person connected to the project should try to cook the recipes both in their original form and in the version with substitutions to make sure that the tastes, appearances, smells, and other salient features are preserved. So, if you like, what's interesting here is that what Epstein is suggesting um, is, uh, is precisely to kind of break the logic of inversion, right? So that rather than just having these kind of substitutes which are, are presented, you actually, you, 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 it's, it's like drawing the circle. You see what happens uh, when I actually try to make uh, these, uh, these, these food uh, dishes because by emphasizing, by, by thinking about the process of, of creating these food dishes with substitutes, um, you're also, of course, engaging in a kind of reflexive activity on translation itself about you know, whether particular forms of substitutes uh, will uh, work. She makes a similar kind of observation about um, and any of you who have uh, used uh, American uh, recipes will have grappled with this, uh, cups or grams. Hmm? So they say two cups of flour and you look at your, uh, your crockery and you think well I've got, a is it a mug? Is it a very dainty uh, Royal Wedgwood uh, teacup? Uh, is it, you know, uh, a good, honest to God earthenware? So, um, so, and you can go to websites like uh, www.onlineconversion.com uh, and you type in. Um, so, two cups would be 4.7317 deciliters. But have you ever seen a recipe that calls for 4.731? Uh, seven deciliters of flour. Uh, no, you don't. Um, so what you do is uh, you tend to round it up to five deciliters of, of flour. Uh, but again, she says um, that maybe uh, when you do this, um, uh, are you in fact uh, interfering uh, with the, uh, the, the nature of the recipe itself? In other words, that the translational act of metrical approximation is uh, something that may, in, in fact, affect the, the translation of the dish uh, itself. And she again would advocate breaking this logic of invert. So the point is, not so much the specific kind of recommendations of a food uh, recipe uh, translator or project translation manager, is what she's doing there is engaging in a kind of a form of slow translation, a, a getting people to think self-reflexively about the process uh, of uh, food translation, and then I would argue by extension, uh, the process uh, of food translation uh, itself. What I want to uh, conclude with um, in terms of the my reflections on, 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 on food translation and, and, and eco-translation uh, um, is um, the area of uh, inter-semiotic uh, translation. Um, Louis Bourgeois, who's an Argentinian cultural theorist, uh, said uh, there are three kinds of animals. Um, there are animals uh, that we watch television with, there are animals uh, that we eat, uh, and there are animals that we're scared of. Hmm? They're basically a three kind of classification of animals. Uh, I'm going to concentrate on, on the middle kind of, of animals, the animals uh, that, 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 that we eat. Uh, and one of the um, arguments that's been made that in the current uh, ecological crisis where uh, the normal background rate for the extension, uh, extinction of species is about four to five per year, um, the background rate for species extinction uh, at present is around about 10,000 species a year. So by the mid-20th uh, century, 50% uh, uh, of uh, species on the planet will be, have been destroyed. Um, currently uh, on the planet, uh, there are about 6 uh, billion humans. Uh, there are 1 billion uh, domesticated uh, pigs. Uh, there are uh, 3 billion uh, cows. And there are 20 billion uh, chickens. Um, uh, this is the one geological trace that will be left of our humanity uh, will be chicken bones um, in uh, millennia uh, to, uh, to come. Um, and most of those uh, animals, of course, are in industrialized uh, uh, meat and food uh, production, uh, which, because animals uh, are increasingly know this, are emotional and sentient uh, beings, uh, often cause uh, extreme uh, hardship. So one of the things we have to think about in the ecological age is how do we relate to the other than human? Because our fate as humans depend on how we're going to relate to the non-human uh, world. Uh, because the, the planet, in, in many respects, will survive us, uh, but we won't survive without a planet. 
Hmm. Um, so we've got to think about uh, the fate of that. Uh, and one of the things then we've got to think about is, if that is the case then, how are we going to relate uh, to other species? Hmm. If there's going to be a sense of our collective survival as you know, species on a, on a planet, that fundamentally raises the question of translation. One of the reasons that colonialism was so horrendous in its consequences, uh, why totalitarian ideologies that your country, uh, indeed uh, more than many others, has been subject to, um, why they were so horrendous in their consequences is that people were dehumanized. And one of the ways of, of dehumanizing people was to deny them language. Um, that the language they spoke uh, was, that you, you didn't translate from, it was ignored. Uh, you know, white settlers hunted down Tasmanian, uh, Tasmanian Aboriginal uh, set, um, um, natives uh, because they, they said that they, they had these animal-like noises, they, these grunts and clicks and squeals. Um, so because they had no language, uh, they weren't uh, human. Um, and it was only when people decoded the Tasmanian Aboriginal languages where they revealed the extraordinary linguistic complexity the emotional complexity, the cultural complexity of the lives of the Tasmanian Aboriginals, did people realize, and of course it was too late, uh, because the last uh, uh, Aboriginals had been exterminated, uh, did they realize uh, what an extraordinary uh, world uh, they uh, in inhabited. So when we have to think about how we're going to relate to other species, and remember food translation and food production is all about the question of our, our relationship to uh, other species that are consumed, then we have to think about uh, how we are going to translate. How are we going to translate between incommensurable forms of uh, communication? Uh, so it seems to me that in a lot of the literature around the post-anthropocentric, around the post-human, um, where there's a lot of reference to uh, different ontologies, the different uh, worldviews uh, of, of species, the one word that you will not find is translation. Um, uh, the one thing that you will not find in the literature of translation studies is any discussion of interspecies communication. Um, so what I would, um, if you like, uh, argue in, in conclusion is that um, as translation uh, throughout the history of translation uh, has been sensitive to uh, historical movements, whether the Reformation, the Scientific Revolution, the rise of imperial, imperialism, uh, the establishment uh, of uh, you know, uh, city uh, civilizations, um, the rise of, of globalization. Um, it is now time for uh, us as translators and for people who think and study uh, and work with translation uh, to think about how translation as a practice and as a form of inquiry it will uh, address um, that issue that was spectacularly ignored by the, uh, Timothy Garton Ash in the New York Review of Books, uh, namely the question of the ecological survival and sustainability of our, our planet. Uh, but I realize that one of the things that we talk about in ecology is soil exhaustion, and I think I've exhausted you <laughs> as an audience, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop now. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this inspiring talk, and I'm sure there are some questions, so now is the time to ask them. You didn't say, but it was written then on the slide, that uh, Polish Smetana is uh, simultaneous to uh, sour cream, right? But actually, the thing is that we use smetana for everything, for each type of smetana. The difference is just in that percentage added on the package. But sometimes in uh, spoken language, we, uh, when uh, smetana is 35% or 40%, we talk about it, uh, uh, we name it as kremówka or something like this. So this would be the difference in Polish between kremówka and smetana, I think, uh, when it comes to creme fresh and sour cream in English. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think that's precisely the point, if you like, from the, 
uh, that discussion on is they're trying to find a, 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 a equivalence, you know, uh, the, 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 what, you know, is sour cream the same as kind of fresh, this and that, um, and of course what what you find is that then forces you into kind of a, a definitional. It's very interesting. You see how how they're defining these different, and of course, um, so so what you're getting is a kind of um, it's a form almost of of equivocation, where you 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 you're, you're trying to find these sort of these functional equivalents, but it, but they're functional equivalents um, that are very much predicated uh, on on the notion of, of of difference. And of course, this is one of the things um, that is extremely difficult. I think because of this logic of, of inversion, for people outside the translation business, outside the you know translation itself to understand, is that there isn't that kind of equivalent simultaneity, that once you begin to dig, um, you, you're then into the definitional, and then, of course, th things go off in all kinds of, of, of different, uh, different ways, yeah. I'm very glad that someone made a down-to-earth uh, sour cream comment uh, after the, you know, your conclusion, uh, which resonated very strongly in an ethical way. I felt really stupid asking some down-to-earth questions, but uh, now I feel I can. So. Uh, uh, my question would be, uh, how do we accommodate and is there room for slow, slow translation movement, if you will, if we're on the second, in the second part of the chessboard? I mean, how do, how, do we, how do we... Because I think we all agree that it's better to translate paying attention to details than not. Uh, it's better to produce those sensitive, uh, culturally sensitive translations as opposed to cheese-like process translations that we, we find. But since the demand is so huge, and since, well, uh, this uh, uh, brings to my mind uh, this wonderful concept of uh, chronodiversity that you spoke about uh, in, your, uh, in the book that we've translated, uh, by analogy to biodiversity, chronodiversity would be like, allowing for different uh, time frames of communication, let's say, as opposed to hurrying things up, uh, that's something that we all experience, not only as translators, but, but as people nowadays. So, since we lack chronodiversity and since there's so much, the demand is so huge and the sheer scale of events is so huge, is there room for slow translation movement? Well, I, see, I think there is. And this is one of the reasons why I'm using the, um, the analogy of you know, what's happened with industrialized uh, food production because the thing about industrialized food, I mean, you know, the slow food movement exists, um, agroecology is becoming more and more important. Um, but the vast majority, if I look at my own country, uh, something like 90% uh, of, of food production is in the kind of the industrialized model. So of course, that, but the thing is that the, the other forms of uh, practice are arising. They're increasing uh, all the time because there is no future for the other form of food production. Um, but there is a future uh, for the, the agro-ecological. Uh, so then you might ask, right, what made the difference? What, what caused the slow food movement to uh, take on the kind of momentum that it's taken on? Why is agroecology now becoming one of the core values uh, of the food and agricultural uh, organization? Two things. Uh, one is, um, if you like, entry into the public sphere. Um, with food as politics as opposed to food as, as product. And the second uh, was um, they made uh, the case for food, the kind of centrality of food to uh, people's uh, existence. Let, let me explain this. That the first was um, the, the people who set up the slow food movement um, said there's no point in, in, you know, in Carlo Fettinelli and his friends, there was 10 of them, you know, having a little farm somewhere in Tuscany uh, and growing, you know, food, and um, that would not cause a, a, a slowing down of industrialized food production. What would cause is the mediatization, the publicization, you know, uh, of um, an alternative approach to the production and consumption of, of, of food. Um, so they kind of... Um, 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 the way they did this, of course, was to point out how central uh, food is to um, one's existence. There's not a single society that could uh, function effectively um, without uh, language. But yet, how many of us in this room enter, have entered the public sphere uh, to argue 
uh, for the importance of language uh, and the, the complexity, the depth, uh, the nuanced nature of, of, of language as vital uh, to our political lives. Uh, one of the things, I don't want to cause too much controversy, but um, uh, you know, around the, the Brexit referendum in, in Britain and the, the rise of particularly xenophobic forms of populism across uh, Europe, is it seems to me it's partly a question of language. Certain words have been hijacked by people and used in a particular way and have been translated intralingually in a particular way. And I think our, uh, our political um, liberties and our democracies are being affected by the way in which that language has been corrupted in, 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 and, and used in particular ways. So I think the first thing is to argue um, that care and attentiveness to language is central to the health of the body politic. Right? And then following on from that, and that's where I think translators got to, to play a role. I mean, they've cut, they played a, an act, well, I'd say, a practical role in terms of the construction of national languages, but now I think they need to play a more kind of politicized uh, role. And I think the second that follows on from that um, is that we need to, to think more and more about what are the, the consequences of the, the reception of industrialized translated languages. In other words, that a lot of the emphasis, and even I've, I've emphasized a lot, you know, I've talked about you know, the, the, the improved software, improved technologies, and so on, the kind of moving second half, but that's very much a production question. But what happens to the language then when it is translated? Um, the first is, is there too much of it? You know? Is there too much <coughs> excuse me, uh, translated uh, language? You know? um, should we save translation <coughs> for more effective forms of translation? And secondly is, you know, are users being really served by the kinds of translations that they're getting in, in particular ways you know, from the uh, localization industry, which of course is, is a concern for the industry itself. I mean, any of the localization specialists here will, could talk about that. But um, so it, it seems to me that <clears throat> really the, the two things are linked. That one is it, it has to be um, moving into the, into the public sphere, that we have to, just as you know, this notion of the commons, of air, water, soil, we have to think of the language commons and how do we, if you like, uh, protect the complexity and diversity and the nuanced nature of the language commons in our societies and translators have an absolutely central role to play. And I think if they do that then, uh, then one of the consequences of that is, <clears throat> is we, we can then promote translational practices um, that draw on the strengths of the... Um, it's, it's a long road, uh, but remember, you know, if you were in the, at the beginning of the, <clears throat> the 19th century uh, and you had a billion dollar industry called slavery and you thought, how on earth am I going to destroy, you know, the economic fortunes of Liverpool, of Bristol, of Brest, of Nantes, you know, uh, this huge, huge industry. Uh, and it was a clutch of people that began to, to, to do it. Um, so, I mean, I suppose, and this is not something you normally associate with the Irish, but uh, optimism, <laughs> we tend to sort of dwell more on uh, the misery of, uh, of, of, of history and our terrible neighbor and the awful things that happened to us. Um, but uh, but I, 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 you know, I would profess a certain, <clears throat> but I think we need to have the right arguments. You know? So, but thanks, Richard. That's a, that's a, you know, it's a very central uh, question. It's a question I ask myself uh, all the time, so my darker days, but um, I think we can be, <laughs> we should be optimistic. Yes, a very simple question. How do you how do you envisage the role of the academia in promoting this kind of slow translation movement? Well, uh, I, th I think that there's a, there's a larger uh, context to your question than a, a more micro one. Let me start with the macro one. Um, I've been kind of thinking about the history of, of, of universities. And I, you know, I see they, they've gone through kind of various stages. Um, the first, and your university here is a beautiful example of what, what I've called a monarchical university, right? So uh, the monarch 
uh, wants to you know, set up a university. Um, you know, he does so initially with the consent of the church, but basically the idea is to move the, 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 kind of the, the, the university gradually away from church power. So we get the, kind of, um, the creation of the university uh, here in Krakow, we get Sorbonne, Bologna, uh, Oxford, and so on. Um, and then in the 19th century, we get the, the emergence of what are called the national universities. So the idea of the Humboldt University, um, that you, you train somebody to become a citizen of the new nation state. So this kind of burgertum, that this, this kind of class of people who will become citizens of this new state. And then at the end, like the kind of towards the end of the 20th century, you get what I would call the kind of the, um, the corporate university, which is, you know, with the rise of supranational institutions, with globalization, uh, with the removal of tariff barriers and exchange controls, you get the university as a kind of transnational institution which is operating globally uh, with students from everywhere, with you know, generating income as... Uh, um, but I... So this is, and this is the model, I think, to some extent, where we're sort of we're, we're between the national and the corporate at, 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 at present, increasingly in the, the Anglophone world and in the corporate. But, um, but I think that um, what we need now um, are, because the, the, the difficulties, the challenges uh, of the ecological age are so immense that the kind of the growth model that we have is no longer sustainable. So it needs a radical change both in consumption and, and in production, um, that we need to move towards you know, what I've called in this latest book, the transitional university. And the transitional university is where we develop forms of knowledge that are appropriate to the challenges of our time. Just as the monarchical, the state, the corporate, they correspond to different sets of societal challenges that in the current moment, and the transitional university, for example, uh, might think about uh, organizing um, the very structures differently. We might, for example, have a faculty of food. And the food faculty uh, would have people from the humanities, it'd have people from chemistry, it'd have people from physics, it'd have people from biology. Um, so they would all be, uh, and uh, so this, this is the kind of, you know, and, and this, you know, in the book I give a number of other suggestions for, for other disciplines, how it might change with this transitional university, but, but the micro uh, context, it seems to me that, you know, what we can do in, in the kind of disciplines that, 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 that that, that, that we have is um, uh, it's what Henry James said, the two basic strategies in writing are telling and showing. Um, uh, I think uh, telling insofar as we, 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 you know, we, we need to demonstrate uh, what happens when you don't take language seriously. What happens when you ignore the language common? Sort of you know, list off the consequences. And the second is uh, to show showing, which is through our translational practices, to things we, how we actually translate, um, how it is possible to translate uh, otherwise, or how it's possible to translate differently, or how it is possible to extend uh, the notion of uh, what translation uh, in, involves. Because one thing is just to, to conclude, um, I, I think that we've focused far too long in translation uh, on interlingual translation. English to French, uh, German to Russian, Polish to Japanese. Um, and we've tended to ignore um, the whole area of the intersemiotic. So I've mentioned interspecies communication, but of course it's things like you know, uh, cultural translation. Uh, you know, when I was here in, 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 in Krakow, I think I've already spotted two Irish pubs, and that was in the space of an hour. Um, so what happens when the Irish pub gets translated? to Krakow or to Rome or to Berlin. Right? I mean, it's, it's not the smelly, uh, foul, dark, dirty hole that I drank in uh, when I was 16 and 17, you know? It's this beautiful uh, manicured, you know, where I can get all kinds of uh, lovely dishes, you know, uh, and craft beers uh, and Californian wines, you know? Um, so obviously something has happened in translation. So, uh, so I think we need to kind of, um, and the other is in the area of intralingual translation, right? I, I talked, you know, a few minutes ago about what I think are the toxic effects of certain uses of language in our political systems. Uh, and I think that's how within, you know, within English or within Polish or within Hungarian, um, that, uh, or within French, uh, recently within, in France, is that how words are being 
you know, intralingually translated, how they're being presented, how certain concepts are being presented to, 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 to people. So I think developing intralingual translation strategies where you're going to present, uh, uh, I, th I think that uh, would be extremely useful. So, um, you know, I, so that's where I, I, I really do think, you know, we, we have a very crucial role to play, but it's a crucial role to play, I think, um, in a micro con but then I think we should think about the macro context too. So, sorry, it's a very long answer to your question, but... <laughs> Um, um, and Professor Cronin, after your last uh, answers, I think I have rather a comment um, um, because uh, you've already answered uh, what I wanted to ask. Um, <laughs> if, um, uh, when, when you were uh, uh, talking about the parallel between uh, slow food movement and slow translation movement, I thought uh, I have uh, an obvious example, uh, which is translating poet poetry. Uh, I think it's the the, the, the slowest, uh, the slowest possible. Um, Douglas Robinson would probably say the pa painstaking process of, of translation. Uh, and my second thought was, yeah, it's it's for the chosen few. Uh, the demand is too slow, as as uh, in the case of uh, uh, slow food movement. Um, it, it won't save the world, I'm afraid. Uh, and so uh, the more important to me was your uh, comment about uh, publicization and optimism. Uh, thank you. I see the uh, the light in the in the tunnel. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> A, 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 a response, except I, I was thinking of, you know, um, an Irish poet who uh, translated um, Polish uh, poetry into into English, Seamus Heaney, and he's an essay called "The Government of the of the Tongue," uh, where he he basically, you know, he talks about this attentiveness to 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 to, to language, but also that poetry translation, which you say, you know maybe a, a minority practice, but that the, the lessons from poetry translation uh, are much, 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 much wider. You know? um, uh, I, I often think, you know, it's very odd sometimes. I was talking to a friend of mine recently, a poet translator, about this, is that, you know, I was saying, I've yet to sort of see people, uh, you know, give out to quantum physicists because, um, you know, what, you know, you just, you just that, you know, Hermetic herm thing you're 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 involved in in um, your uh, your laboratory, um, but you know it's it's it, it's no relationship to anything else because of course um, it does you know at um, their exploration of the, the the physical world. But I also think in, in poetry translation, for me they're, they're almost like the, quant the quantum physicists of language. You know, they're, they're people who are working at you know at the the the, the frontiers of um, the expressible and the inexpressible. Um, and then, uh, but that becomes a kind of um, an experimental laboratory for the possibilities of language itself, which is which is necessary if language itself is to 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 to, to evolve. You know, which I, I think is another um, another dimension of. Uh, I, I say this only because <clears throat> in a lot of translation training uh, or education programs, um, uh, certainly in the English-speaking world, you, you have to fight very hard to protect. Uh, literary translation. I mean, it's, it's easy to make the case for pragmatic translation, um, scientific commercial, but it, it's it's trying to, if you like, um, safeguard the the, the uh, literary translation as, as a form of, of translation practice. Um, it's important to marshal uh, arguments for that as well. But thank you for your, your comment. Thank you for this. Uh, inspiring uh, lecture and i would like to ask a question about um, about the discursive construction of this uh, concept because um, if you're predicting the future in uh, such a strong way making prophecies about the future so uh, there's a background to uh, postulate um, a modernist anti-capitalist tendency which is stressing uh, uh, the slow ecological movement of the civilization. Uh, the, the, that's a very strong discourse um, which is um, uh, well known in the history with uh, Wordsworth and Heidegger. Heidegger is a key, would, could be a key figure to, to this uh, slow translation 
slow attitude to, to the environment um, movement. Uh, is there any threat in this uh, thinking? You, I, I would like to ask about this uh, like a self-critical reflection <laughs> about this concept and its historical background. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much for that. That's, that's an extremely, uh, it's a very, very important question. Um, for me, the, the major uh, threat is what I would call the kind of the fetishization of the, the local in the sense of kind of uh, the kind of brut and boden, you know, the kind of blood and soil um, that, you know, that, that making, you know, the, the specific, the, 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 the local kind of sacrosanct. You know? Um, and that, that leads to all forms of kind of very dangerous closure, you know, and, and a, a kind of reactionary uh, a, a, a anti-modernism. Um, but it seems to me that's, that this is precisely why the, the, the paradigm of, of translation is, is, is so important, because what translation does is that it's, it's, it's always that kind of... Um, <laughs> what I would call the movement downwards that is a movement uh, outwards. Um, if, if, if I can give a practical example. Um, off the, the, the west coast of, of, of my own country, um, there are a small group of three uh, islands, um, which are called the, the Aran uh, Islands. Um, and the, the biggest uh, in Ishmoor, the, the big, big island, um, has it about, you know, 14,000 fields on this big, big island. Um, and it's often, the island is Gaelic speaking. Um, it's, it's often seen as the kind of the, uh, the heart of uh, Gaelic language and culture, and by extension, <coughs> you know, Irish identity. Um, and a, a, a mathematician and a, a map maker, cartographer, Tim Robinson, you know, he, um, explored this very small uh, island, so this kind of small uh, local uh, space. Um, and the more he delved into the history, um, the place names, uh, the, the artifacts, uh, the more, of course, he finds uh, influences from Scandinavia, uh, Roman uh, influences, Greek influences, influences from uh, North Africa. Um, so, in other words, um, what he, what he finds, the more he, 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 he digs down, is the sense of outward connectedness, of a kind of a translational relationship with, with, with elsewhere. So for me, the, the, the most important thing in, in using translation as the kind of the, the core paradigm here is to avoid um, the forms of, of closure that I think haunt a particular uh, tradition of kind of localized uh, and anti anti modernism with I, I, I think a certain kind of Heideggerian tendency to 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 to, to, to fetishize a place in, in a way that's not always uh, helpful so I, I don't know if, it's a very complex question but that's just one strand of, of, of an answer to it uh, thank you very much for 